Namo Buddhaya, Namo Amitabhaya. Hello, everyone. So today I'd like to continue to talk about the life of the Buddha. So in the last episode, we talk about how when the Buddha came into this world, he will demonstrate the eight phases of manifestation or the eight phases of enlightenment with enlightenment being the most important phase. And last time we discussed the first phase that is to descend from the to sit to heaven. So Bodhisattva Prabhapala, right, the previous life of Shakyamuni Buddha before he came down into our world, he was a Bodhisattva called Prabhapala, living in the Tusita heaven, the inner court of Tusita heaven, and expounding the Dharma to the heavenly beings to await for his time to descend and become the future Buddha. So we also talk about how he carefully chose the family he would be born into. Right? It was not a coincidence that he was born as Prince Siddhartha to King Shuddhadana and Queen Maya in the country of Kapilavastu. All this was a careful investigation. It was a careful plan, right? a divine plan, a divine play that he was going to demonstrate. And we discussed all this in detail in the last video, so we won't talk about it today. And today we'll talk about the second phase entry into the mother's womb. So when the Bodhisattva was in the heaven, when he observed that it was about time for him to descend, all the heavenly beings, they were very sad. And they were like, oh, Bodhisattva, you're going. We can't hear the Dharma anymore. And Bodhisattva Prabhupada passed his crown to Bodhisattva Maitreya, the future Buddha. So we know that currently Maitreya Bodhisattva is expounding the Dharma in the inner court of Tusita heaven to await for his time to come down as the future Buddha. So Bodhisattva Prabhupada passed his crown to Bodhisattva Maitreya and instructed Maitreya Bodhisattva to expand the Dharma to the heavenly beings. And in the sutra, it also said that um, another heavenly being told all those heavenly beings, oh, you don't need to be too sad. After Bodhisattva Prabhupada goes down to be the future Buddha, uh, eventually he will also return back to the heaven realm to expand the Dharma like all the past Buddhas. So after Buddha's performance in the human realm, after he entered uh, Paranirvana, but he never really entered Paranirvana, we discussed that before, uh, he will also have incarnation in the heaven realm to help the heavenly beings, uh, also in the human realm and many other realms. So he will have countless incarnations in different realms and countless worlds to help save sentient beings. Uh, this we also discussed before. Uh, in the Lotus Sutra, it also revealed us and many other Mahayana sutras, right? it talk about how the Buddha will never really enter Parinirvana. Right? Parinirvana is merely a play. Right? Just all this is like a divine play. And before he came down, he also discussed with the heavenly beings which form he should take to enter into the mother's womb. And all the heavenly beings were making different suggestions. Right? Some said, oh, as a young man in the form of a Brahmin, and some said, oh, as Lord Chakra or Lord Brahma, right, all these heavenly beings, etc. And a heavenly being said, according to the Vedas, right, the ancient Sanskrit holy text, for a Bodhisattva to enter into the mother's womb, one should take the form of a great six tusk elephant. Those who are truly learned in the Vedas will recognize such form and will predict the arrival of the one with 32 marks. So, we'll predict the arrival of the Buddha. The Bodhisattva needs to take a form that by the priests of the Vedas, the prominent priests at that time, they could recognize, so they could give the prediction. So people know that this is not a normal birth. And in fact, all the Buddhas, by the Bodhisattvas, will take birth as a form of a white elephant with six tusks for a few reasons. I first we talk about because the Veda said that right, if he is gonna be the Buddha, he will take the form of the six task elephant. And also because the elephant represents the bodhisattva path, the bodhisattva practice. So 
It's a white elephant with six tusks, uh, with the head being red, and with golden netting. Uh, a beautiful giant elephant. So why an elephant? Uh, why the color white? So white represents purity. Uh, the Buddha is here to lead people on the path of the Dharma, the path of purity. And second, when we think about the elephant, we know that the elephant is extremely giant. Uh, extremely massive, big. So this represents the Mahayana path. Uh, an elephant can carry many beings to the other shore. Uh, unlike a rabbit, a rabbit is too small. I can't do that. And also, why six tasks? So the six tasks represents the six parameters, uh, the six professions of the Bodhisattva practices. Uh, that is generosity, um, morality and to observe the precepts, patience or forbearance, diligence or effort, meditative concentration, and through that it gives rise to the great wisdom of shunyata, uh, the transcendental wisdom of emptiness. So the six tasks represents the six professions of the Bodhisattva practices. And also an elephant is gentle. When we think about an elephant, we are not afraid of the elephants. But when we think about lions, we are afraid of lions. An right? elephant is even more giant than a lion. But an elephant is known for its gentle, uh, compassionate temper. So that's also the quality of the Bodhisattva. Right? The Bodhisattvas will not harm any being. The Bodhisattva also have the gentle temper like an elephant. And an elephant has four trunks. The four trunks also represents the four bases of transcendental power. So what are the four bases of transcendental power? At first is design or intention or will. And you need to have the design to practice meditation. And second is diligence or effort. So you need to put it in effort. You need to be diligent in your meditation practice your Nianfo practice. And third is meditative concentration right, or single-minded mindfulness. Right, this is because through effort, through diligence, one can obtain meditative concentration, one can be single-minded. And fourth is meditative insight, right, wisdom. Right, through being mindful, through being single-minded, it can give rise to wisdom. So these are the four elements that are conducive to obtain transcendental power or to enlightenment. So this belongs to the seven sets of 37 auxiliaries to enlightenment, which we won't discuss here in detail. It's another entire different topic, but it's good to know why the Bodhisattva took the form of a great elephant with six tusks. What's the meaning? Of the elephant. In fact, all the bodhisattvas, the future Buddhas, when they enter into the mother's womb, they will all take the form of a white elephant with six tusks. No other beings, no other heavenly beings, ghost beings, etc., can take the form of a white elephant. This is the mark of the bodhisattva. And we know that Bodhisattva Samadabhadra rides on a white elephant with six tasks right? because this represents the Bodhisattva practices, the Bodhisattva path. So Bodhisattva Samadhabhadra is renowned for his uh, 10 great practices and vows. And for any Bodhisattva who want to realize Buddhahood, one must practice, I must practice the 10 great practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadhabhadra. Uh, this we discussed before and we'll also talk about it in more detail in the near future. Uh, even for us, when we go to the Pure Land, we'll also continue to practice the 10 great practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. Uh, this is extremely important for any Bodhisattva who want to realize the final Buddhahood. Uh, you cannot skip the 10 great practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. For those who are interested, 
I talk about what are the 10 great practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra before uh, in one of our Sutra Talks series. Uh, but in the future, I'll also talk more about it. Even for Pure Land practitioners, if you haven't practiced this now in this life, uh, you will practice when you are in the Pure Land to realize the final Buddhahood. So not only the Bodhisattva chose his family carefully, his mother carefully, and also what form he would take when he entered into the womb. He also chose the time of his entry. So when he observed that the cold seasons have gone, uh, it was the third month of spring, when the weather was not too hot, not too cold. It was just the perfect weather when all the tree leaves unfurled and the most exquisite flowers blossom. I, when the time was perfect, this was the time for him to descend from the Chisita heaven and to enter into the womb. It was the 15th day, a full moon, when the Bodhisattva observed that this was the right time for him to come down. Uh, he moved fully conscious, fully aware. Uh, unlike us, when we go into a mother's womb, we were not aware. And most of us were not aware uh, when we reincarnated. Uh, whereas the Bodhisattva moved fully conscious and fully aware, he displayed many auspicious signs uh, when he descended from the Tisita heaven. So uh, according to the sutra, he illuminated great bright light, uh, which is brighter than any of the celestial light. Uh, even uh, the light could penetrate through to the darkest areas where the sun and the moon could not penetrate into. Uh, for instance, the hell realm. Uh, when the Bodhisattva descend from the Tisita heaven, his great light even could illuminate the hell realm and the hell beings. Uh, before they couldn't see their hands and all of a sudden they could see their hands. and Many beings knew that the Bodhisattva is going to go down to this world and to become a Buddha. Uh, this was written in the Sutra. Uh, this was like a great news for the entire Trichilocosm. Uh, everyone knew that uh, the future Buddha is about to be born. And they all vowed to be born in Kapilavastu, uh, to be near the Buddha, to accompany the Buddha. So countless heavenly beings, they vow to be born in Kapilavastu and also different beings, uh, including beings in the hell realm, if they have enough merit for them to reincarnate as a human, they also vow to be born near Kapilavastu uh, to accompany the Buddha, to be with the Buddha, to listen to his Dharma. So when the Buddha was born, even also countless Buddhas and countless Bodhisattvas Heavenly beings, uh, the eight legends of Nagas and Devas, and all beings from different realms, uh, if they have the good enough merit, uh, they could be born as a human, uh, they all vow to be born uh, to be near uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. So uh, the sutra also mentioned many uh, incredible, miraculous uh, signs, how the entire trichilocosm shook in six ways and displayed 18 great signs. So the sutra mentioned all these signs in detail. And for those who are interested, you can go and read the sutras. And a great sage called Asita in ancient India at that time. Right? There were many sages in India. So he saw these great signs and he knew that a holy person would descend uh, into this world. And when the Buddha enter into the womb. Right? Many gods uh, and the eight legends of Devas and Nagas, right? all these are Dharma protectors, uh, they all guard over him. And countless heavenly beings came to make offerings. Right? We even saw in the sutra how the Buddha, when he was in the womb, right? he was even expounding the Dharma to the heavenly beings. And when the Buddha entered into the mother's womb, right? he was fully conscious he was fully aware the whole time uh, when he descended, before he descended, and during the whole time he was in the womb, and after he came out, he was fully aware. Uh, unlike us, how we reincarnated uh, due to um, our thought of delusion, uh, a thought of a lustful thought, 
in the sutra of entry into the womb it says clearly uh, if we uh, like the mother or we hate our father then we will be a male uh, on the opposite if we uh, grew attachment to the father and we dislike the mother we will be female so how we reincarnated uh, is due to uh, the lustful conduct of our parents and our own lustful thought right? a thought of ignorance and we enter into the mother's womb and where we enter we enter through the birth canal right? really a place of impurity but where the Bodhisattva entered, he entered from the right side. Like he would never enter from the birth canal because he uh, came here not because of impurity, not because of ignorance. Right? So he will always enter from the right side. Right? All the Bodhisattva, the future Buddha, will enter the mother's womb from the right side. And he will always stay on the right side, not on the left side. Why? Because He's here to lead people on the right path. Like the Dharma is always right. So he's staying on the right side. And when he moved fully conscious, fully aware, he was also in seated meditation. I cross legged in the mother's womb. And before he came down into the mother's womb, I, in the mother's womb, there appeared a jewel temple. So he was actually staying in the jewel temple in the mother's womb on the right side the whole time. So unlike us, I, when we were in our mother's womb, we got contaminated uh, with very like dirty stuff uh, inside the mother's body. Uh, when we saw a baby was born, uh, usually quite dirty, right? it was not so clean. Uh, different from the Bodhisattva, uh, the Bodhisattva when he was in the mother's womb, According to the sutra, a jewel temple I was being manifested on the right side of the mother's womb and he was staying in the temple the whole time. And he was fully aware and conscious and he was in seated meditation cross-legged. So different from us, when the Bodhisattva was being conceived, he was actually uh, came with full limbs. Everything was already fully developed unlike us right? the bodhisattva did not have to go through the full uh, embryonic development stages and uh, when he came he came with all the full limbs like uh, fully aware fully conscious like uh, all the organs and the characters have already been fully formed uh, unlike us we at first we were like uh, this embryo and then slowly slowly it gave rise to form and slowly slowly we have nose, eyes, etc. So different, I thought the Bodhisattva already came with everything and he was just seated in meditation the whole time on the right side of the mother's womb and he did not move. The mother did not experience any pain and discomfort uh, in her stomach, in her belly. Uh, even the Bodhisattva moved, he would not experience any discomfort. Uh, unlike us, when we were uh, in our mother's womb, we may move from right to left, left to right, and we may our mother feel uh, really uh, discomfort. And also, uh, before the Bodhisattva uh, descend into the mother's womb, uh, Queen Maya, uh, the mother, all of a sudden felt like observing the eight precepts uh, before he came down. So he was conceived not because of impurity. Unlike us, we were conceived because of our parents' uh, impure thoughts and our own impure thoughts. And so all these causes and conditions combined together. So we ended up in our mother's womb. But when the Bodhisattva came down, it was not because of the lustful conduct between Queen Maya and King Shuddhadana. Uh, on that night, uh, Queen Maya said to King Shuddhadana, I tonight I will observe the eight precepts. And hence, the Bodhisattva descended and entered into the mother's womb from the right side. So he was conceived because it was his time to come down to carry out a mission, not because of any impure conduct between Queen Maya and King Shuddhadana. It's important to know that the Bodhisattva was born out of purity. Unlike us, we born due to our thought of ignorance.
And after Queen Maya saw this white elephant with six tusks enter into her womb, uh, she experienced a great, great joy. Uh, she never experienced such happiness before. And he asked the king to ask people to predict, you know, what this dream uh, was about. And those who are learned in Vedas, I could predict that uh, this is not an ordinary son. This is a holy son. Uh, he will either become a Buddha if he renounced the palace, or he could be a king uh, if he stay in his home. So everything was already planned out. And when Queen Maya uh, was bearing uh, Prince Siddhartha, everyone loved to see Queen Maya. In the sutra it says, for the beings who were in Kapilavastu, who were being possessed by other spirits, when they saw Queen Maya, they regained their consciousness and they were cured immediately. And even for those with all kinds of illness, when they saw Queen Maya, when Queen Maya extended her right hand and to touch on the top of their head, then they were free from their illness. So Queen Maya had this had magic power when she was bearing Prince Siddhartha and she was free from greed, anger and ignorance and she was enjoyed in meditative absorption. She felt this rare happiness that she had never experienced before. That she was always at peace and she also had uh, this magic power to heal the illness of others. And not only that, she began to practice bodhisattva practices, and she was very generous towards all beings. She had this compassionate heart and wanted to benefit all sentient beings. So the sutra talk about all this uh, in great detail and how the baby's characteristics can really influence the mother. And we also knew that uh, Kumra Jiva, the great uh, translator who translated many Buddhist sutras, from the Sanskrit into the Chinese. Uh, when the mother was bearing Kumrajiva, all of a sudden the mother could speak Sanskrit and the mother became so wise in the Dharma. And she could even debate with other people about Dharma. So these were like real stories uh, for those who are interested. Uh, you can look it up. And for those who are interested in the life story of the Buddha in more detail, uh, you can read the sutras yourself. So I'm just talking about them uh, briefly. Okay, so in our next video, we'll discuss about his miraculous birth. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Amitabhaya.